My father used to come once a week from Vendrel to visit me. We would go for walks together, sometimes wandering into music shops looking for music scores, and after a few hours, he would have to go back home. The repertoire of the ensemble at the Café Pajarera was broader than the Café Tost. I continued my solos, and of course, I needed more music. One day, I told my father I needed especially to find some new solo music for the Café Pajarera. Together, we set off on the search. For two reasons, I shall never forget that afternoon. First, my father bought me my first full-size cello. How proud I was to have that wonderful instrument. Then we stopped at an old music shop near the harbor. I began browsing through a bundle of music scores. Suddenly, I came upon a sheaf of pages, crumbled and discolored with age. They were unaccompanied suites by Johann Sebastian Bach, for the cello only. I looked at them with wonder. Six suites for violoncello solo. What magic and mystery, I thought, were hidden in those words. I had never heard of the existence of the suites. Nobody, not even my teachers, had ever mentioned them to me. I forgot our reason for being at the shop. All I could do was stare at the pages and caress them. That scene has never grown dim. Even today, when I look at the cover of that music, I'm back again in the old musty shop with its faint smell of the sea. I hurried home, clutching the sweets as if they were the crown jewels, and once in my room, I pored over them. I read and reread them. I was 13 at the time, but for the following 80 years, the wonder of my discovery has continued to grow on me. Those suites opened up a whole new world. I began playing them with indescribable excitement. They became my most cherished music. I studied and worked at them every day for the next 12 years. Yes, 12 years would elapse, and I would be 25 before I had the courage to play one of the suites in public at a concert. Up until then, no violinist or cellist had ever played one of the box suites in its entirety. Thank you. 
That was Dave Egar performing the first two movements of the cello number one by Johann Sebastian Bach. Thank you, Dave, for the beautiful introduction to tonight's lecture. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, friends and colleagues. On behalf of Crossroads, I extend a warm welcome to the 2017 Albacete Lecture on Faith and Culture. A special thanks goes out to the Chin Center for hosting this special event. I am Mario Paredes, a member of the Crossroad Advisory Board. More importantly, it is my privilege and great joy to have been able to call Monsignor Lorenzo Albacete a close friend for almost four decades. Like so many touched by his daring, authentic face with an unfailing kindness, I can testify to his genius. A genius that was not just intellectual, but that was also evident in his sheer humanity, his compassion for others, his ready embrace of people of all backgrounds and belief his boundless and eager curiosity about every person that he met, discovering in each and every human encounter a constantly renewed invitation and encouragement to encounter his savior. Monsignor Lorenzo was in all respects an expert in humanity but never in abstract. Tan Lee, at the heart of his priesthood, was his faithful devotion to the care of his ailing brother, a task he fulfilled until the very end of his life. The primacy of that commitment often made him late for appointments or sometime even cause him to fail to show up for the speaking appearances. Indeed, he was far from the conventional type, both as a person and a thinker. He pushed the envelope in all that he did. He decisively and traditional way prompted the Board of Trustees of the Pontifical University of Puerto Rico in Ponce to ask for his resignation only nine months after naming him president of the university. His rapid oster earned him the moniker of Lorenzo the Brief. <laughs> then there was the time way back in 1978 when he was tasked to drive Cardinal Carol Voitiwa 
around Washington, D.C. for some sightseeing, and the two of them became engrossed in a philosophical discussion. Monsignor Lorenzo promised to send the visitor some books as a follow-up. That never happened. And he was reminded when his new acquaintance returned as Pope John Paul II the following year and gently scolded Lorenzo for his neglect when the two met again in St. Matthew's Cathedral in Washington. I'm bothered by the demands of a schedule and relatively superficial obligations, Monsignor Lorenzo preferred to look into the depth of things. That spirit animated a crossroad from its start in 2007 until our dear friend passing on October 24th, 2014. He once expressed that vision as follows, and I quote, confronted with an intensely polarized social and cultural environment, we have to resist the temptation to side with one party against the other, to identify enemies and fight their ideas. We cannot reduce the scope of our cultural work to apologetics. This would be a betrayal of crossroads original motives. The goal of our cultural work is not so much defending what we think we already know to be true, good, and right, but rather rediscovering in its reality again and again. This rediscovery is necessary because what is true, good, and right is not an idea or a doctrine. It is a living person. As Father Yusani once stated, looking for the traits of this person is the nature of reason. Close quote. Tonight, we are truly blessed and honored by the presence of Father Julian Caron, the president of Communion and Liberation, to deliver this year's Albacete Lecture a professor of theology at Milan Catholic University of the Sacred Heart. He took over the reins of the movement after passing of Monsignor Luigi Giussani in 2005. Please consult the program for his stellar background, and I warmly recommend his book of essays entitled Disarming Beauty, in which, just as in tonight's lecture, he tackles what some have identified as the lack of ontological density. That leaves so many men and women in contemporary society feeling unmoored. Father Caron, will deliver his talk in Spanish. So please use your headsets for a simultaneous translation in English. Simply turn on the volume wheel on the receiver, place it number one. Please help me to welcome Father Caron to the stage. Thank you very much. 
de repente all of a sudden cayeron bajo sus ojos las páginas the pages descoloridas the discolored pages fell before his eyes que aparecían la suite de Johann Sebastian Bach in which the suite of Johann Sebastian Bach appeared y él Casal miró aquellas páginas and there Casal saw those pages con todo el asombro with all the amazement que determinaría su vida which would determine the rest of his life todo comienza everything begins por un hecho because of a fact absolutamente sorprendente a fact that is absolutely surprising que todo lo demás. that precedes everything else por eso el hecho for this reason de haber escuchado the fact of having heard hace unos instantes a few inst a few moments ago suite, this suite con el cello of the cello this cello suite es como la síntesis is the summary como la clave the key de lo que estamos celebrando en esta noche of what we're celebrating tonight que because toda la vida de the entire Albacete, the entire life of Lorenzo Albacete ha, ha estado definida was defined por este hecho by this fact en el 2004 in 2004 en un encuentro que tuvimos en Italia in a meeting that we had in Italy él nos contó cómo empezó he told us how su aventura aquí his adventure here began. He said, I want to highlight this word friends. Everything that happened was possible only because we recognized that we were friends who had a mutual respect for one another. He used to ask himself, what do I do with these, these lay people who have a secularized conception? These are intellectuals, directors, eminent directors of important U.S. newspapers like the New York Times, the Washington Post, etc. Progressive magazines like The Nation or The New Republic. Documentary producers for NPR. Professors of various universities. The encounter with these people took place in a completely accidental way for me. Como para Casal. Just like for Casal. Estas personas se reúnen These people meet once a week. Y habían expresado el deseo de admitirme. And they had expressed the idea of the desire of admitting me into their circle, el círculo which de I had called the lefty, lefty salon. salon. Allí there they política, discuss politics, art, mundiales, world problems, philosophy. Estas cosas but they discuss these things because they realize admiten they admit that they don't know anything new about them. They meet precisely because they recognize the need to encounter a new way of facing the problems of modern life. They're aware that their old school secularism no longer has anything to say to today's life. It's the experience of an impasse. And Albacete continued. In the first meeting of the Lefty Salon, I asked them why they had invited me. Because they're famous people, experts in things that I have no idea about. One of them told me that he had invited me because despite the fact that they have many priest friends, none of these priests had anything interesting to say. Nothing different from what they had to say. And then he added, those who think differently from us don't want to be our friends because they think we're evil, that they have to avoid us. One of my friends told me that he had invited me, this is Lorenzo speaking, because even though I don't think like them, I appreciate their companionship. This reasoning that Monsignor Albacete made amazed me. I could see the diminishment of the energy of my friends from the very beginning because an intellectual discourse is not able to overcome this impasse. Only a fact, only an encounter brings liberation. 
con estos amigos, in our meetings with these friends y con otros como ellos, and, and others like them, we have to be aware of the danger of reducing our own experience, our hope, excuse me, to the correct terms of a discourse. Solo un hecho only a fact can break the impasse through something that is undeniably evident. Es esto, lo que this is what hoy today we want to a vivir, live no again, como de un pasado, not, all, not just as a memory of the past, but as presente. a present experience. El libro the book que the, the book that we're presenting and about which we're going to speak a little bit tonight has a lot to do with Monsignor Albacete's experience that he described. For many years, a publishing house in Italy was insisting that I publish a book, but I didn't want to add, I didn't need to add anything to my own bibliography. And I had many things Pero, to do. But the possibility of being able to offer, like Albacete said, some contribution to this disorientation that we're living in this moment of crisis that affects us all forced me to finally accept this invitation that for many years the Italian publishing house had made. My intention was, like him, the, the possibility of establishing a 360-degree dialogue where I could meet people who were completely, at least apparently, distant from us, who later revealed themselves to be much closer than I could have hoped for. So, the presentations that we have made over the last few years of this book, and which I'm doing now, have been the occasion to open a dialogue with totally different people from us. But those who have a question, a desire to know what's going on in reality. And the first thing that, that amazed me, just as it amazed Monsignor Albacete, is that so many people who are so different, so diverse, so much more authoritative than I, with, with life histories that are so different from my own, could be interested in the contents of this book. This has been such a surprise for me, because it's been a surprise to be able to experience this, that this disorientation so many live paradoxically reveals itself to be an occasion for encountering others, because many people who I who I've met and who belong to his sto life stories that are very distant from my own have seen their own ideology fall apart. And now they, they see themselves, they find themselves to be more open to the possibility of dialogue. And this allows me to understand what is the task that we all have in front of us. It's, an, it's a stupendous moment in order to share with the others what has happened to us, as it happened to Monsignor Albacete. With many people, this has become the beginning of a path that has been completely unforeseeable, unimaginable. But that's what happened. As Pope Francis says, processes have opened, and we don't know where they're going to take us. This is going to depend on how each of us fans the flame that has been born, as it was born in Casal or in Albacete. I would have never thought, I've never would have thought that so many people would become so dear to me in such a short time, even to the point of, of sharing the very depths of their lives in a completely open dialogue, even about the most intimate and true aspects of their own lives. All these people with whom I've dialogued about this book, Disarming Beauty, in Italy, Spain, or Latin America, wish, desire to continue this, desire, this dialogue. And this relationship with them has continued to the, to the point, in many cases, of becoming friends. 
Sincerely, I did never, I never imagined that what we live, what has been given to us, as it was to Monsignor Bassette, could be so interesting to so many people today. In this particular historical moment in which everything seems to be falling apart, and that it could bring about the desire to go deeper and to continue dialoguing. Because so many of the people that I have met and which I dialogue with have their own wound, as we all do. For this reason, during the presentations as I dialogue with intellectuals, journalists, politics, po uh, politicians, and businessmen, I tried to dialogue with the person of today, with his or her doubts, uncertainties, insecurities, fears. All of them look for an answer that would welcome them, a proposal that would welcome them an encounter in which they would feel embraced as they are. I found a completely unhoped for openness. Many of them understood that identity and openness are not against one another, and that in order to dialogue, it's not necessary to dilute one's own identity. It has been a dialogue in which I have, I have once again learned by answering the questions of people whom I've encountered the method, that, the very method I believe in already. I have verified that, that dialogue is the only method to measure oneself against the freedom of others because there's no other way of relation, of having a relationship with truth if it is with, if not through freedom. I never liked the idea of giving pre-canned, pre-packaged answers, but instead of helping people who I encountered to suggest to them a path by which they could achieve, reach these answers through their own experience, because that's what has helped me in the first place. Like when I met Don Giussani, I already had many of my own answers. I went to the seminary when I was only 10 years old. I studied theology. I had a PhD. But I, as I used to say to Don Giussani, when I met you, I, I began to really walk down a truly human path of the faith, and it's only by following the path of experience have I been able to encounter the complete density of all the things that I had learned before, rediscovering them as something absolutely new. For this reason, I wanted to share with you tonight some of the intuitions that perhaps can help us to understand what is the situation in which we find ourselves today. In the first place, let's try and understand what's happening, a change of era. Pope Francis said that we're not living in an era of change, but in a change of era, of epoch. Situations that we live today propose challenges to us that are, that are even difficult to understand. That's what Pope Francis said to the Italian church in Florence in 2015. We find ourselves, as it were, in a dark wood, confused, disoriented. And this, this dark forest makes itself even more dense because certain certainties which we all used to share are less and less shared every day. And we find this in many of the conversations that we, we have every day with many of the people that we live with at work. Why, why should we have work? Why should we work? Why should we have a, why should we have a child? Why should we have a family? Why, we, why should we love someone or try to change society or welcome the people who come or welcome immigrants, or why should we not respond to terrorism in a way that creates more violence? Problems that urge us all and that pose many, many questions to us. I too want to understand this. Why does this happen? 
And I share the judgment of, the, of Matthew, Crawford, Matthew Crawford, the sociologist and philosopher, who says, as the inheritors of layers of theorization about the human person, we find it no trivial task to recover a more direct access to our own experience. Unquote. Already some years ago, I was struck by a, a phrase of a Spanish philosopher, Maria Zambrano, in which she, she put the emphasis on what Crawford was saying, and I quote, what is in crisis is this mysterious nexus that unites our being with reality. Something so profound and fundamental that is our own intimate nourishment. So, so when this nexus, this connection is lacking, we find this difficulty to understand ourselves. And we be easily become slaves of those who want to point us in different directions, tell us what to look what to look at, because we don't know ourselves. Since we don't have direct access to reality, we depend on what others tell us. Crawford continues, quote, without the ability to direct our attention where we will, we become more receptive to those who would direct our attention to where they will, to the omnipresent purveyors of marshmallows, unquote. That is fashion. We're more easily suggested. We buy more things. But why? why? Why did all this, this collapse happen? The collapse of the things that up until recently seemed very certain, evident. I've been, I was very helped by a sentence of Pope Benedict that he, spoke, he said several years ago because it says it in a way that perfectly sums up this point, this point of what's happening right now. He speaks about the time of the Enlightenment, centuries ago, in which after the great breakup of the religious unity of Europe, what we all shared the Christian faith with the Protestant Reformation and then the famous, the so-called wars of religion in which we Christians fought amongst ourselves. There was the attempt to try and create a new basis for social life. And so, the great genius of Immanuel Kant was the intuition that, that what could be the basis of this new social fabric was to try and safeguard the great convictions that Christianity had brought forth so they could be the new basis of society. But in trying to, to safeguard these convictions, the idea was that they were so evident that they didn't need to be connected to the religious history that brought them about. And it's very significant. There's a text that is very significant a text of Immanuel Kant's, in which he says, we can easily believe that if the gospel had not first taught us the great convictions that we all share, the universal ethical laws, in their original purity, reason would never have been able to recognize them. They would never have been able to achieve them in their fullness. Kant himself recognizes that without the contribution of Christianity, without the gospel, 
Christ, we would have never been able to recognize these values. With our own, with our own intelligence, we wouldn't have been able to. But now, now that they exist and we know them, we no longer need to belong to that place that brought them to us, which is the church. We can recognize them with our own reason. So for that reason, he describes very well, Pope Benedict describes very well that, that in that era, they th we th people thought that the great convictions that came about because of Christianity were undeniable and could survive on their own. But these strong words of Pope Benedict strike us because did they mean that Kant was right? What happened in the face of the challenges of history? Have they held up in the, throughout the vicissitudes of history, the quest for a certainty that could resist all the vicissitudes of history. What happened to it? Pope Benedict says, it has been a failure. What we are living is the failure to separate the great convictions that Christianity brought from their historical origin. So we, we, we had this idea that once we understood them, now that we had the content clear and our own moral strength, we no longer needed to belong to the church and therefore we no longer needed to belong to Christ. This, this, this ingenious attempt Effort, Pope Benedict says, is what we are seeing fall apart. This is the profound nature of the crisis, the economic crisis, every, every type of crisis in which we find ourselves paralyzed. This is only the appearance. We've lived through world wars, technological revolutions, but we all shared this, these great convictions. The problem is that now these great convictions have disappeared from the overall life of people, the common life of people. And so it's difficult to reach an agreement on the most elemental, elementary things. Henri de Lubac describes this very clearly. These great values, and he's referring to the values of spirit, reason, freedom, truth, fraternity, justice, without which true humanity doesn't exist, have quickly become unreal. They preserve many values of Christian value, of origin, Christian origin. But once they are separated from their source, separated from their source, we have to realize that what we have in front of us are ideals. Ideals which are too abstract, collective myths. They are pale, lifeless, when we put them in front of the idols of flesh and blood, the power, the fashion power. Pope Benedict uses the same word of de Lubac, unreal unreal, as if these values had gone up in smoke. They lost their, their reality, their concrete, authentic existence. Why have they disappeared? Because de Lubac says, if they don't continue to come from their origin, from the event, from what gave them origin, 
and how they came into our very day, to our time, they become unreal. The interesting thing is that today, the Catholic theologians say it, it's not, excuse me, not Catholic theologians, but a sociologist like Bauman, he says it. What we believed was immobile, what couldn't fall apart, what couldn't collapse, what couldn't go into crisis, becomes liquid. We're in a, in a liquid society. It no longer has the same consistency, ha consistency it had. What we shared for, for centuries, we no longer have in common. I believe that confusion is a common feeling in our societies today. It's as if we found ourselves constantly in the middle of a hurricane, like the hurricanes that have devastated the Caribbean recently. We feel disoriented without security. Thomas Friedman of the New York Times describes it well. For him, the confusion is due to the rapid change in the world, which we knew and which we almost don't recognize any longer. Friedman writes, this mismatch is at the center of much of the turmoil roiling politics and society in both developed and developing countries today. An important chapter in this history is the role that the church has played in the process. The great poet T.S. Eliot asked more than half a century ago, is it the church who abandoned humanity or humanity who abandoned the church? We are dealing with a pertinent question, but it is clear that something has not worked in the transmission of the faith, in the communication of this certainty, of this evidence, in order for us to arrive at the situation in which we find ourselves. Already in the 1960s, it was clear that secularization and atheism could be seen as a way for Christians, according to Pope Benedict, even then, at that point, Ratzinger, it was a way for Christians to discover the true nature of Christianity. Whatever the responsibility of Christians in this situation may be, the loss of evidences is a problem which affects all of us. Of whatever denomination, whatever position in society, whatever position we have in front of reality, again, whatever, of whatever stripe, atheist, Christian, Buddhist, agnostic, left, right, we all find ourselves in front of the same challenge. For many people, this crisis is an unfortunate, terrible thing, but it can be generative. Hannah Arendt says the crisis poses questions for all of us. Arendt says a crisis forces us back to the questions themselves and requires from us either new or old answers, but in any case, direct judgments. It's fundamental to understand what's happening to us. A, a crisis becomes a disaster only when we respond to it with performed judgments, that is, prejudices. Such an attitude not only sharpens the crisis, but makes us forfeit the experience of reality and the opportunity for reflection it provides. This crisis is an opportunity. It's an opportunity to this dialogue and to put ourselves in front of these questions. Because in this way, it will come to light. We can see who is really capable of answering, of offering something that responds to our questions, to these questions. And they are not abstract questions. They are questions that enter into the drama of life. Why do I go to work? Why do I get up in the morning? Why do I get married? 
no, why do I not just live with someone? Why do I have a child? Why is it worthwhile not to steal? Why shouldn't I cheat someone? Why shouldn't I do violence to someone and imposing the truth on him? Why is it that a religion shouldn't put truth, impose truth on others by means of violence? These are questions we all have. We ask ourselves these questions, we Christians. What we have to offer. These are normal questions that people ask themselves in normal life. A friend of mine told me that in the day that she announced that she was getting married, everyone looked at her astonished. So young, why are you getting married forever? When they went to the wedding, they couldn't believe what they saw. They couldn't believe it. As soon as they got back from their honeymoon, everyone was asking them about, but what happened, about all the beauty they had seen. This is what happens. For most people, to get married is an empty thing. Only when they see the beauty of something can they intuit that they, they may be losing, missing something. They don't understand, but, but may have something beautiful as they just saw in that wedding of a friend. In a situation like that, allows a dialogue. People are more open, curious. But what's the condition of that dialogue? Third point, freedom. If I had to choose a word to identify the content of the current challenges, if I had to choose a word to represent the, the challenge in front of us, I would choose this word. Freedom is the greatest, is the, the value most, most appreciated, most understood by our culture, most precious. It appears as the, the highest good, said Ratzin to which everything else is measured. In this enlightened culture, freedom appears as the fundamental value, which measures everything else. This is a challenge for every situation. No puedes ser encontrada la verdad you can't meet the truth without freedom. In this sense, it's very useful to realize the path that the church itself has made. In the Second Vatican Council and the understanding of freedom and the relationship of, of Christianity to freedom, there is no access to truth unless it's through freedom. freedom religious freedom, said Pope Benedict XVI, is a necessity that comes from human freedom. It cannot be imposed from, without, from outside. It can only be realized through a process of conviction, of certainty. Religious, religious conviction comes from this freedom. It's not simply a new strategy. We can't just change strategies. No. This is not what the church has learned. The church has learned that the, natural, the nature of, of Christian truth can and must be realized through freedom. 
It cannot be imposed from outside. Man has to embrace it himself and make it his own through freedom. The truth cannot be imposed except by the strength of the truth itself. For this reason, Ratzinger realized that it was, this was the great value of the Enlightenment, that it, the merit of the Enlightenment was to have drawn attention afresh to those original Christian values and given reason back its own voice in its constitution on the Church of the Modern World, the Second Vatican Council restated this profound harmony between Christianity and Enlightenment, seeking to achieve a genuine reconciliation between the Church and modernity. For this reason, there is a great challenge in front of the Church and in front of freedom. In order to be free, we used to, th for a long time, it's been, we believed that you had to be free, free of all, all shackles, of all confinements. But we've discovered that that's not enough. The la a lack of, of constrictions, of freeing ourselves from our shackles is not enough in order to fully realize freedom. In order for our freedom to move, it has to have a reason, an adequate reason. It needs something attractive, an attractive, something attractive that moves, that moves us. In this situation, there's a question we must confront. Is there something capable of attracting our freedom to the point of making it move? There may be people who are afraid of freedom, who prefer not to use it, because to use our freedom, you can't just be un unshackled. Is there something really worth moving towards? What makes it worthwhile? If there isn't really something that challenges freedom, and not to lose it, I need to use all my freedom. I want to, I want to discover what it is that is worth my while, worth my while to, to move, to work. Otherwise, man stays paralyzed in his own, in his own being. If there isn't something that, that moves him in the most intimate, in the center of his being, Despite all appearances, all of his action, all of his agitation, they're not capable of moving his being, of moving his true self. This can happen at the personal level or at the social level. Some things have struck me very much, and someone wrote me, and I'll tell this letter that someone wrote me, Last night, I went, to the, I went to dinner at the house of some high school friends who are engaged in living together. After dinner, we talked for a while, and during the conversation, the question of whether or not to have children came up. My friend said, I will never bring a child into the world. What is the point of condemning another poor thing to unhappiness? I don't want to assume that responsibility. And he added, I'm afraid of my freedom. In the best case scenario, it's useless. And in the worst case, I can cause someone a lot of suffering. What I hope from life is to cause the least damage possible. We see this person does not have a good enough reason to bring a child into the world. It's not good enough not to be constrained by things. It's not good enough not to be forced to do things. It's not enough to put all of your freedom and all your reason into play. No, 
algo que está tan difundido this is something so common como Kafka, que es como un emblema it's like someone like Kafka who is decía, almost an emblem of our culture se temen la libertad y la responsabilidad. We fear freedom and responsibility. And for this reason, we prefer to, our, to asphyxiate ourselves, to asphyxiate ourselves in the cage that we've built. We're always looking for something to, um, um, to get the burden of our freedom. Get rid of it. In order to, to, to put myself into play and, and do everything that I can, I need something, something that moves my person, that implicates me this in a love. If something doesn't pull me out, we don't have a reason to put our freedom into play. We all find ourselves in front of this challenge. And how do we answer? Going beyond the war of religion, mindset that hasn't led anywhere, I read that Russell Moore, president of the Ethical Commission of the South Baptist Conference, Moore points towards the reconciliation rather than hegemony obtained by means of the imposition of truth. This doesn't mean withdrawing from the world, but rather changing the method with which we relate to others. Just like our wonderful Albacete did in meeting with his friends from the Lefty Salon. More rights, a Christianity that is walled off from the culture around it is a Christianity that dies. Let's be those who contend for culture, but not those who are at war with the culture. We will recognize the necessity of engagement in social and political action, even as we see the limits of such action, but we will engage, not with the end goal of winning, but with the end goal of reconciliation. This means that we Christians, just like every man, must rediscover a way of being present in society without cultivating the claim of dominating. What could the method of this presence be? What could be the method of this presence? For me, I have no doubts. There is only one method, the method of witness. And, and, I, and I'm, I was surprised to find him more the, the same understanding, the same perception of the question. He writes, the church now has the opportunity to bear witness in a culture that often does not even pretend to share our values. That is not a tragedy, since we were never given a mission to promote values in the first place. But to speak instead of sin, and righteousness and judgment of Christ and his kingdom, only through a witness, like at the very beginning of Christianity, can we contribute to the good of people and society. In a society, in a society like ours, you cannot create something new except with a life. Not an organization, not an institution, just a new life. Something that becomes real and becomes real in, in front of us in a visible way, and in an unreal way. Only a new life, real, attractive, like getting married, like going to work happy, like dealing with the difficulties of life with it in a different way with the ability to give meaning to things that others just dream of. Only this new life can really revolutionize structures, relationships, and everything that we, that we find, that we encounter. Pope Francis is a witness to this, to this beauty, this disarming beauty, disarm beauty. Whoever you find, he doesn't do anything except testify this, testify to us. 
and to elicit from others the desire to live the faith like he does. And so we begin with this astonishment, this amazement, like with Casals. In the, the Bach suite, or Albacete getting together with his friends, or us being the most important people in life, in our lives. We can only communicate this in the same way with which this truth was communicated to us. Pope Francis perfectly identified the question, saying, Anestesia que afecta al hombre de hoy ante el sopor de la vida que puede despertar la conciencia. Anestesia que afecta al hombre de hoy ante el sopor de la vida que puede despertar la conciencia. Anestesia que afecta al hombre de hoy ante el sopor de la vida que puede despertar la conciencia. Anestesia que afecta al hombre de hoy ante el sopor de la vida que puede despertar la conciencia. Anestesia que afecta al hombre de hoy ante el sopor de la vida que puede despertar la conciencia. Anestesia que afecta al hombre de hoy ante el sopor de la vida que puede despertar la conciencia. Anestesia que afecta al hombre de hoy ante el sopor de la vida que puede despertar la conciencia. Anestesia que afecta al hombre de hoy ante el sopor de la vida I repeat the great phrase of Dostoevsky, a learned person of our days, can he truly believe in the divinity of the Son of God, Jesus Christ? This isn't a question that's skeptical or frightened. This question is, the is a unique opportunity for the church to enter a fascinating path as the Pope as Pope Francis said to the meeting of Rimini in 2015, when men busy themselves in life without courage or strength or the necessary seriousness in order to express the decisive questions, it is a great occasion for Christianity to demonstrate its difference in front of the new challenges. Will this be able to become a proposal that is sufficiently fascinating so as to attract the freedom of the men and women of today, as Albacete did with his friends? How is it possible? It will only be possible if the proclamation comes about through the experience of beauty. In fact, beauty, because of its own nature exercises an attractiveness that is c capable of moving freedom and reason without any sort of force. How is it possible for a man to discover the truth of himself, as Don Giussani used to say? People recognize the truth of themselves through the experience of beauty through experiencing the zest for life in correspondence, perceiving the attractiveness that the truth brings about, an attractiveness and a correspondence that are complete, not in a quantitative sense, but the qualitative sense. Beauty is true when it leads me to say it is the truth. So, my friends, we are in front of this opportunity. Do we, do we believe in the capacity the faith has to provoke in others the attraction that we have found, the fascination that we have found for beauty, the beauty of the faith? This question made me think, made me think because faith, because the Christian faith, is nothing more than the faith in this disarming beauty because when, when God decided to help people find themselves, find the path to themselves to make life worth of being lived, he sent his son without any power, only his unarmed self. And this, and this is the underlying theme in that title, Disarming Beauty, because this beauty of the truth needs no other weapon than its own attractiveness to fascinate us. For that reason, the only access to truth is through the attraction, the witness, the incarnation of this beauty, this truth of life, that make reason and freedom awaken. When people find themselves in front of a Christian proposal like this, 
These are the type of reactions they have. A very well-known journalist and writer from Catalonia wrote in a very important paper in Catalonia, La Vanguardia, a comment which which she wrote after este meeting me in, dos, uno fuera in uh, la otra Barcelona. She said, no it didn't matter whether one of us was a believer or the other was a non-believer, because the dialogue that was established was within the framework of two fundamental principles. And according to Coron, principles that are, found, that are the basis of Christianity, individual freedom and respect for the other. And, thus way, and, and in this way, from the edges of the spiritual impulse that the, from the two opposite sides of the spiritual impulse, that of religious faith and of rationalist doubt, we unraveled the knots of this time, this convulsed time in which we're living, this uncertain time in which we're, in which we're living. Julian exposed the disarming beauty of Christian faith that is presented to others without tributes, without shielding itself, without ambitions, with the only hope of serving humanity. And in this friendly back and forth between us, I personally responded that to me, this faith was strange, was foreign to me, but it was luminous. But what, what, the, what believers achieved was luminous. In fact, she said, this is the type of proposal I would have loved to encounter when I lost the faith at 16 years old. So people are waiting, are expecting for us to witness to the faith in the way that we've received it freely. Not just for us, but for all of those whom we will meet along our path. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Father Caron. I know now I have the privilege, dear friends, of inviting to the stage Father Jose Medina, the National Coordinator of Communion and Liberation in the US, who will ask few questions to Father Caron. I didn't get an applause. <laughs> Thank you, Mario. <clears throat> I think there is not much to add, Julian. No. Uh, but I, I wanted to I agree ask with you. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to ask a couple of things. We've been on the road. We've been on the road since Sunday. And uh, I can say that I have witnessed firsthand uh, the things you were speaking about at the very end. We've met people um, <coughs> with whom um, this, this dialogue was a, really, a real event. Uh, it was very struck in particular yesterday, uh, the day before yesterday, we were in St. Thomas University in Houston and after the, the round table, one of the administrators um, came to me and said, you know, in St. Thomas, we do a lot of these events. We had at the round table with you, there was a, a man who happened to be a Muslim, two people who happened to be Baptist and a Catholic. And he was saying, there are so many of these moments uh, that we have at St. Thomas University that, of religious dialogue, inter-religious dialogue but they usually tend to be moments in which one person says, this is how I think, the, other, the next person says, this is how I think, the other person says the same. And instead, he was saying, tonight what I saw was five men talking. 
five men talking as men. Um, and I, I think these moments like this I saw during this, these last few days, moments in which um, something happened, and it happens because somehow the people participating spoil themselves from the idea that they had, and they enter into a sincere dialogue. The other side that I saw also was um, always a fascination with what you were saying, especially when you were talking about the event. But in some of the, of, of the people that were contributing, I also perceived this yes, but. The event is not enough. Uh, because there are so many things, that, there are so many problems in life, is this is not enough, no? Or we need to come up with at least agreed on a common language, or at least in some basics, some basic uh, moral principles. At least, so like, as if there are these two paradoxic, uh, two, m two moments that I saw during these days. The fascinating uh, face of that event that moves to a man to say, uh, to say to you, you are a barbarian after my own heart. Um, and to, yes, it is beautiful, but we, we cannot renounce to everything. So with this um, little bit of a long introduction to this question, I wanted to ask you to tell us what is your, your personal experience of these days on the road. Um, because you have chosen to actually do this tour, as you said in the talk tonight, as moments of dialogue, not to tell you what the book says. And I also wanted to hear from you, so like if you notice the same thing that I noticed from that yes and small but. Thank you, Vic. <clears throat> this is the reason because I started this evening uh, focusing in the event that happened in Casal, that the event who happened in Albacete. Because when they had to identify what is the important key to understanding what are the development of the whole thing, they started to identify this particular event suddenly, said before Casal, suddenly. This, it was unpredictable. Something new that happens, but that changes everything. Like Albacete, the, the fact that they were invited that he was invited to this relationship with people who were so far away from their own mentality. But it was, again, unpredictable. It was a surprise for him. But it was the starting point of a process, we can say, with the words of Pope Francis. And this is what is difficult to convey to others, the crucial importance of this event. <coughs> because all of the rest is the development of this event. But without this event, it's, imp it's impossible to understand anything. For this reason, in one of these dialogues at the uh, Notre Dame University, I insisted uh, in a human experience that everybody uh, has. Uh, and it's impossible to reduce only to a speech or to a doctrine or to a ethics that is falling in love. 
When we understand what is the nature of falling in love, we immediately recognize that it's impossible that a uh, series of lessons about love can produce the event of falling in love. Because it's so self-evident that nobody thinks that this could happen only after lesson. Otherwise, everybody who is alone would uh, attend this lesson. No? Of all of the people who are looking for somebody to be loved, no? this course would be an enormous success. <laughs> there are no courses that can uh, be sell, can be sold for, for this, for solve this, this, the question of loneliness. Or that after have the good theory, I can produce the event of falling in love, doctrine or ethics. But when we say that Christianity is an event, we at the end think that this is a doctrine. If we will repeat the doctrine, we can produce the event. Or I can produce the event with my performance or in my attempt of being coherent. But it's impossible. For this reason, the only way in which an event can be produced is when the event happens again. It's impossible. For this, when this event doesn't happen, it's impossible. But Christianity, first of all, is an event. Before whatever other consequences or development, it is an event. And only can be happens as an event. And this is really difficult because a doctrine we can manage the doctrine. We can manage the ethic. We have the set of rules. We can learn a book. But with the simple of falling in love, it's impossible that anybody can think that reading a book can produce the event. Christianity is the same. And it's difficult uh, to pass, to convey this awareness of the nature of Christianity. But when it happened, when, when, as happened these days in, in some moments in our tour, like in, in Houston last day, uh, it's obvious for everybody because everybody recognizes what is happening before then. And it's easy. Like, it's easy to recognize when somebody is falling in love. It's self-evident, even for others who are uh, like a spectator of this event. All of them immediately recognize what is happening. Your face is different. Are you falling in love? Is that the question? Immediately, they don't know anything about what. Only they recognize in her face when she uh, arrives to go to work that something has happened. This is obvious. And this is one of the most beautiful things because for this reason, every moment of this dialogue is an event. It's, it's new. It cannot be repeated, no? Because uh, you can have some draft for um, some particular occasion, but, but after the first moment in which I uh, made the, the, the first presentation, the draft is useless because every moment is a possibility of meeting people, of en encountering uh, the real 
wound of the person who you are talking with. Uh, and this is amazing because it's the possibility of uh, became friend, became uh, companion uh, for this journey along the way of the life. And this is what is more um, fascinating of this book, not the book of himself, but the possibility of entering in dialogue with people and meeting uh, them in his own, or their own particular situations, struggles, um, questions. And the, the one thing that I found very striking also is that the, the people who were most moved during these days that we met were people that then, during the dialogues, were actually talking about their own personal experience. Uh, meaning, they, they, I'm thinking about Ernest Morel in Notre Dame, saying like there are moments in which I read this book and I went downstairs running to tell my wife or my children. Mm -hmm. um, tell us this account, this, uh, uh, this episode, because this is amazing that somebody can read a book and when he discovers something, he has to stop and to share this with somebody. This is something that's happened. How many times we can tell to others some kind of experience like that? And, and the same thing in, in when we were in St. Thomas University in Houston, how uh, we had asked the speakers to prepare some questions. And surprisingly enough, the questions were personal questions, as if like the book had been more a provocation to themselves than they were not questions about in, in an unscripted ways. We, we didn't tell them uh, prepare this type of question, but it surprised me that before the book, Disarming Beauty, some people reacted personally. Mm -hmm. The people that were most moved by it. Mm -hmm. There is one moment, and I want, I want to ask you this question also, because it relates to what you said tonight, you spoke a lot about freedom. And in the conversation we had in Denver, at some point you, you made this very strong statement that in a sense polarized the conversation, saying that if I am not in speaking about freedom and speaking about the event, you said that if, I, if the ultimate judge of my experience is not I, then I have no dignity. And I relate that very much to something that you said also tonight, that you want to invite people to begin a road, a journey, mm -hmm. not to give them, you were mentioning at the very beginning of the talk, I already had the answers. I needed to walk the road and relate this very much to freedom. So. I wanted you to comment a little bit on this aspect here. I think it's one of the most beautiful things that had happened in my life because I became enthusiast of communion and liberation because of this proposal. Because I went to the seminary when I was 10 years old and I have received all my for a religious education and um, I studied theology and um, arrived to the PhD degree. So the contents more or less no, uh, were mine in somehow. Um, at least as a content but it was my own experience who, which made me uh, recognize that something that didn't work. Because in my experience, uh, there was some uh, question that I recognized that weren't solved at all. And in this moment, 
I met Tade Giussani. And he offered me a, a method that was experience, you know, in which uh, he describes experience as a particular confrontation, a, a, a validation you know, uh, of every kind of thing that happens in my life. If something corresponds to my more intimate desire, or something doesn't apply to this desire. And this is crucial to understanding what is the way in which I couldn't, I could little by little rediscover in my own experience, the content of theology of Christianity that I have received in the seminary and in my studies, uh, theolo theological studies. Because only if we can do a journey, in which we can discover what is the meaning of everything for, my, for our life, Christianity can be interesting. Otherwise, it's a repetition of doctrines or ethics that are not able to answer. There is no capacity of answering to our wounds. Instead, uh, these tools that Yusani puts in my hands, experience, to judge everything happened in my life in, in this uh, comparison with my heart, my exigencies, uh, it was the possibility of understanding in a new way all the newness of Christianity. For this reason, I have learned this for my experience. And I try to offer everybody, the possibility of starting a journey, like I uh, made myself. Because otherwise, only the repetition of some truth, even if it is true, it's not something false, uh, it's not possible that this truth became mine that I can understand what is the meaning of this truth to which I adhere without rediscovering this truth in my own experience. Because uh, God, to make us understand what is the most important thing in life, instead of an explanation, he made them happen in our life. Instead of, make, of offering a lesson about love, uh, we arrive to the world in a family in which we can experience this love. Instead of uh, a lesson about falling in love, he makes happen that I become in love with somebody because only the event can introduce us to an understanding of the content of love, of the content of justice, of the content of mercy, of the content of pardon, everything. The most important thing is life can be understood only through experience. After uh, this experience that with, I was always grateful to Don Giussani, I rediscovered that what is the reason because Giussani offered this, because he started to face uh, the, in the 50s of the last century the same problem that we have now uh, 
Facebook. In Milan, in the last century, it was impossible that somebody can be born there without belonging to the church. They were everybody baptized, they received the Holy Communion, the, the confirmation, uh, they belong to the church. They were immersed in the church. But when Yusani met him in the high school, most of them have uh, abandoned the church. What happened? It was the question. What has happened that all this kind of introduction to Christian life didn't work at all? And he started a new method. Instead of repeating the doctrine that they already know, he started to provoke their experience, to make them understand what was the relevance of Christian faith for life. Because without recognizing what is the relevance of faith for life, it would be useless to convince them of the, the mistake they had made abandoning the church. And only when some of them, many of them, started to, re, to rediscover faith, they were constrained in somehow no, to reopen the, the question that they have closed in the relationship with Christian faith. And in that moment, the, some of the, of the some of people in Milan uh, accused Don Giussani that he insisted too much in experience in a state of doctrine. And for this reason, uh, the Cardinal of Milan uh, asked him to to dip uh, more what is the concept of experience. And he tried to, uh, to persuade the cardinal that without this experience, the boys of, of the high school couldn't understand what is the meaning of Christianity. Because we need to imagine when the Christianity started that God decided to send his son. How can Christ can introduce others to Christian life? With a speech with uh, ethics only, only an event, only when they were struck because they didn't see anything like that before. They were so moved that they started to follow him. But there was something that happened before then. And in every gesture, the disciples were displaced because the newness, it was so far away from their own experience that only if they see what was the difference, they can understand, couldn't understand. They could understand what is about Christianity. Only it became visible. All the liturgy of Christmas time is this paradox. What was invisible has become visible. This is what Henri de Libati said. What was visible in a moment became invisible again, unreal. This is what is happening now. It's the contrary. Only 
if this became visible, we can understand what it's about. Because we think that all of us know what Christianity is about. Everybody has his own idea, but many of them are only reduction of these ideas. Even Kant thought that he was uh, update about Christianity and because he adhered to the gospel in somehow. But, but he has reduced Christianity to ethics and, 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 and doctrine. And when we think many times about Christianity, it's only this reduction as many of the Pope recently have remembered and recalled. For this, without this kind of experience, it's impossible that people can be introduced to Christianity today. I just wanted to close with a final question. Um, something that I also notice in these days, uh, traveling with you and the conversations that I witnessed, is that Everyone, and I would say everyone without exception, was enthralled in the conversation and interested. And I was mentioning before there was a yes, but. Uh, but there were moments in which it's very easy to actually get out of this logic of the event, out of the logic of experience, as if what you are saying right now or what you've been saying during these days works for the little things or works for my personal spiritual relationship with God, but doesn't have the power or the capacity mm -hmm. to Change. solve the world's problems. You just came uh, from the United Nations where you had a conversation uh, sponsored by the Holy See and uh, with, uh, with uh, Dr. Amitai Etzioni and with Denunzio, and, and it was a beautiful conversation. It's, it's also very easy to see how from something that is, I'm thinking about what the Greeks said to St. Paul. What you say is very interesting, but right now we have very serious problems to deal with, to deal with. Uh, which are real problems. I mean, we are persecution. And uh, so I guess to close, even more at a personal level, so like you seem to be extremely confident in the fact that it is this way, the way in which world, our society can find peace, can find justice, can find dialogue. Not only every person that we can find, that we, we don't need anything before this experience here. So, and, and I noticed as if in many comments, uh, I noticed it also when, when you were in Notre Dame, I noticed it also, so like this almost fearless love of freedom, and, but even more that fearless love of man's freedom, this fearless uh, certainty that, that Christ is seeking man and that if man is open, it will be grasped, it will be embraced. So I wanted you to ask, uh, to, to tell me a little bit briefly, mm -hmm. to close, where do you find the certainty or how, what is this certainty rooted in mm -hmm. that allows you to go to places and say, you know, that the solution to every problem, to every problem, without a but, without a limit, is in doing this, living by the event, following your experience, risking your freedom. That, as Marlon Hall uh, said yesterday, as if, the safest thing we can really do today is to risk everything. Whereas for us, the riskiest thing is not to be safe, no? For two reasons. One reason is that what they are uh, offering no, as solution, because this is what Christian, uh, Christianity proposes, is uh, uh, too weak to uh, unbelievable, no? to be effective, is what they are trying to defend is what is demonstrated as a failure. 
And this is what we don't realize. We think that the problem is to change the culture, to, to change the ethics, to change... The language. The language, to change... That. But all the, this enormous monument that was enlightenment, it what is collapsing before us. But we don't want to understand that. Because we have uh, had all the legislation no, sustaining the whole thing, in the, according to Christian value, to defending life, to defending marriage, to defending everything. It seems that this is more crucial to change the world. But this, that is the, the realization of uh, Kant mentality, the Enlightenment mentality, is what is collapsing before us. But we don't understand, and we try to repeat what has been so a failure. It's like if we don't understand, we don't have a real judgment, a, a real experience of what is happening. Because it's this lack of link between the origin of this doctrine, of this ethic, from the origin, this uh, break that has happened in a moment in history, is what has take, taken us to this particular situation. So, the alternative of this, what is? That the only way that these values or these common convictions can uh, happen again like a visible thing, like a real thing, is the only way in which they were emerged that is linked to a particular history. And this is uh, the real fight that we are uh, doing now. The fight between this common mentality, this enlightenment mentality, that all is possible according to our energy, with our <coughs> intelligence, with our performances, because the event, the encounter, is so fragile that it's impossible that this can change anything. And this is what is collapsing before us. The real objection is not to my courage to say this thing. The real objection is to the design of God. Because nobody could have think, could have thought that to change the world, who here would have started choosing a man like Abraham. To change the world, God decided to start choosing a man. It seems absolutely crazy. Because when we try to think what we have in mind to change the world, we think to have power, to have um, means, to have tools, to have instruments to change the world. God has made an enormous mistake. <laughs> I'm sorry. And we are convinced that we are more intelligent than God. And this is what is the fight today between this mentality, our intelligence, and God's design. 
and we have to decide and to verify in experience what is more capable of, change, of changing the things in a personal level or uh, in a historical level. Because uh, we have seen at the historical level what is the result in the Enlightenment project. Everything is collapsing. And now we have to, to choose again. To repeat the, 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 the same failure is only to the nihilism of the, the, the future or to start everyone in his own experience showing that the only way is that we need some, somebody else who can fascinate our life to engage our freedom and to reawaken our person in such a way that we can offer the other a possibility of living life, not in the future, now, tomorrow morning, to go to the world in a different way. Because this is the only way in which a new life starts to happen, not an utopia in the future. Well, we don't know when, we don't know when, but now, when I meet the answer to my heart, that is only Christ. Thank you. Thank you, Julian.